And we may have a few folks joining as we continue the program, but I want to just start by welcoming everyone today. My name is Katie Christensen. I am the Curator of Education here at the University of Wyoming Art Museum, and I'm so delighted that you all are joining us for our lunchtime conversations with curators. So this is a monthly program that we do at the Art Museum and with the COVID pandemic, we've pivoted to an online fashion. So on your screen is my colleague, Rachel Cook, the Curator of Academic Engagement in the exhibition space where material tradition is on view. So if you're around Laramie, you can come in person to view the exhibition. And if not, we're trying to kind of get you in the space as close as possible. So the goal of a program like this is to really just have access. And each month we focus on a different exhibition um, and bring in special guests. So November is Native American Heritage Month. And so we're really excited to bring in some experts who are gonna be sharing some bead work with us today. And I'm gonna introduce them in just a moment. But I do wanna mention if you want to take a look at material tradition, I'm posting a link in the chat where we've got another variation of the exhibition that you can uh, take a look at on your own time as well, if you're not in Laramie. So this program, I should mention, is also supported by the Wyoming Arts Council, which was receive support from the Wyoming Legislature and the National Endowment for the Arts. And we're delighted that they help sponsor arts and culture in the state of Wyoming and beyond. Um, a couple housekeeping notes today. We are going to have time for some conversation and Q&A, but to make that a little easier, we're going to ask that if you're a, not a presenter, you keep yourself on mute during the program and use the chat function. And then I will go ahead and uh, read the questions as folks come in. So please keep active during the conversation in the chat box. Um, and if you don't know where that is, there's a, a bar along the top or bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little microphone to unmute yourself. You can even turn your video off if you'd like, but it's delightful to see everyone's faces as well. Um, let's see. The last thing before I introduce our special guests is we would like to uh, share the land acknowledgement and I think it's especially important during Native American Heritage Month. This is a practice that we do in all of our programs, but it seems more pertinent right now um, as we celebrate this, this culture. So collectively, we acknowledge that the University of Wyoming occupies ancestral and traditional lands of Cheyenne, Arapaho, Crow, and Shoshone indigenous peoples, along with other Native tribes who call the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain region home. We recognize, support, and advocate alongside indigenous individuals and communities who live here now and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Um, and now our special guest, I am so delighted that so many people have shared their cultural heritage with us during this exhibition and this month. Um, I'd like to introduce Michelle Sunset. She is our assistant curator at the Art Museum, um, and she helped put together this exhibition that is on view in the gallery space right now. Um, you are seeing the screen, and that's, Mich uh, sorry, that's Rachel Cook in our gallery space. Um, also joining us today is Deborah Littleson. She's our business manager at the Art Museum, and her tribal affiliation is Crow and Northern Cheyenne. Our special guests today are Sandy Ironcloud, who is the Wyoming Indian High School language arts instructor, cultural mentor, traditional club sponsor, and the speech and forensics coach. I have a feeling she does so much more than that. Um, and she's a Northern Arapaho. And additionally, we have Allie Soundingsides, who's a UW student majoring in energy resource management and development here at UW. She's also Northern Arapaho. So please help me in welcoming all of our special guests today. And I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle to kind of talk a little bit more about the exhibition that we're uh, viewing now. Take it away, Michelle. Thanks, Katie. It's so nice to see everybody virtually. 
Um, so the exhibition material tradition features textiles in the art museum's collection. It was originally envisioned as a sort of prologue or pairing to the material slip exhibition that was up earlier this year. And that featured contemporary textile works. We wanted to take a look in our own collection and see what kind of examples of more traditional textiles we had to share from around the world and from different time periods. We really wanted to tap in and kind of share this long global tradition of making and using textiles, both in daily life and in ritual. I was personally really excited to get to work on this exhibition, um, along with our director and chief curator. I got to help curate this very shortly after I started working here. Um, this was back in February or March-ish, right before the pandemic. Um, and as somebody who really likes to do embroidery work and cross stitching and sewing, which I learned from my mom as a kid, I felt personally connected to this exhibition. And it also really helped me to bond and connect with some of my colleagues here. Rachel, who's running the video, is super knowledgeable about textile arts and she actually lent me a great book and she helped in the early process of kind of looking at the objects beforehand and assessing what we might be able to show. Um, also, Deborah, who we'll talk with a little bit more later, she helped me to learn so much more about indigenous beadwork. She was sending photos to her family and coming back with all kinds of insights that I really wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, and so hopefully we'll get to talk with her a little bit more about that. Um, but Deborah and I also connected about our own personal sewing projects. She and her husband have been sewing up really beautiful masks and dresses. So I, I really do feel a strong affinity for this subject matter. But Western art historians have long categorized the fabrication of textiles as craft and not really considered them on the same level as you know, fine art like paintings and sculpture. And that might be partly because textiles are so deeply embedded in our cultures that they're accessible to people of all classes. And also, unfortunately, um, it's the perception of them often, but not always being created by women. So the result is that we don't often have a lot of information about the artists or creators of these works. But clearly, you can see on the screen with some of these great close-ups from Rachel, they take a great deal of skill and artistic vision to produce. So with that all said, Rachel has been showing us kind of the broader exhibition, which as Katie mentioned, we definitely encourage you if you're able to come see it in person. And we also have a lot of great information on the website if you want to look more into it. But for this program, I'm excited to focus in on the two pairs of moccasins that we have on display in honor of the upcoming Rock Your Mocks Week and Native American Heritage Month, which I'm really excited to hear more about from our special guests, Allie and Sandy. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll pose kind of the broad question to you both in looking at these um, and in thinking about moccasins in general. What can we say about the materials used, colors, symbolism, anything like that? Did you want me to go first, Allie? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, first of all, I want to thank you um, for inviting me to be part of this meeting. And I'm very honored. Nanana na bete nani be. Uh, my Indian name is Sinan Cedar. I was named by my grandfather, Benny Goggles Jr., who was one of our uh, ceremonial leaders among the Northern Arapaho people. I am Northern Arapaho, and I'm very happy to be here today. And in looking at, you know, um, for, you know, I'm 58 years old, 
and I'm still learning many of the uh, oral traditions that have been handed down from our families throughout our families and you know, much of the regalia that my grandchildren wear and that I wear have been made by, by me, uh, particularly the dresses. But, you know, I'm not uh, what you would call an expert with um, doing the beadwork and doing the moxins. But, you know, it's what I grew up with too as well in how um, our designs are, you know, come from uh, the family, so to speak, you know, my husband, uh, with the beadwork that we've done with our grandchildren uh, as they were growing up and our own children from his family in South Dakota, you know, you have the E diamond E and we incorporated that in many of their uh, regalia as they were dancing and so forth. And, you know, the moxins that I see, I know Deborah shared with us, you know, you see the plain style and you see two distinct styles there. You have the Northern Cheyenne uh, type of um, beadwork, the one on the left, and also you have the crow style with that flat, flat uh, beadwork. My daughter-in-law has also um, made many uh, different types of uh, moxins, not only with that flat style as well, because she's part showban. And what you see there is also kind of reflective of the showban design. Among our people, the artisans that we have here among the uh, Wind River, we have uh, people like uh, Marcus Dewey, uh, Charles Dewey, Janie um, Brown, uh, Gloria Runs uh, Gloria Goggles, um, Jenny Runs Close to Lodge, Elena Singer, um, Pam Locke, and you know, um, I believe Zadora Enos also as well. You know who are uh, who have made. And I think Roxanne too, Roxanne Hines, you know, they're, um, they're well known for their beadwork. They're well known for the moxins and uh, other types of regalia that they make. And I believe you have a cousin too, um, one of Crawford's boys who is also awesome with the moxins, Ali, I can't remember his name right offhand. You know, who has done different types of uh, both baby moxins, adult moxins. Um, I'm not sure, is it? Uh, I'm not sure who, who you're thinking That's of. That's one of the twins, Crawford's. Uh, Marcus? Yes, Marcus, yeah. I've seen some of his work displayed and it's totally, totally awesome. Yeah. And you know, in, in earlier conversations that we shared, um, you know, whenever you do beadwork, whenever you do even sewing, even cooking, you put that good feeling into it, you know, you never do anything while you're angry or even when you're feeling sad because so much emotion goes into that, you know, your feelings and, you know, your, your when, when I did moxins for my, my babies when they were small, you know, cause those were easy for me to make. And, um, you know, I, I did it with, with love. I did it with uh, patience because by no means am I an expert. No, I'm not an expert on uh, the different style, uh, the different um, ways of how you can do moxins. And, you know, for the thing, is, the important thing is to remember that, you know, whenever you see a purse, whenever you see moxins, whenever you see a dress, you know, it's reflective of that person. It's reflective of the tribe that they belong to. You look at the um, plain style, the teacup dresses that you see, you know, that came evolved as a result of, you know, the trading days, the trade cloth dresses, you know, you look at those different types of um, dresses that came about, you know, from the early trading days, and you look at the dentalium work that you see, you know, with the capes of the different, um, you know, now you see the, uh, the, the, uh, the dentalium capes that many of the traditional dancers wear. And you look at earlier pictures from probably, I'd say, you know, the 30s, uh, the 20s and the 30s, those dentalium dresses were actually, those, the dentalium was actually sewn on the dress, whereas now you see more of the capes. And that's part of the evolution of, um, of how artwork changes too, you know, how, because, you know, things constantly change with a different, you know, things that were introduced to, 
you know, quill work was generally the first, you know, that was the first way of how they adorned their moccasins and, you know, their um, whatever, you know, articles they made to wear, what, whether it was uh, decorating their, their shirts, decorating their dresses and so forth, you had the quill work, which was made with the natural dyes. And then that evolved into using the seed beads from the trading days. And now you see the tricut beads, you know, you see that um, that's a good example of the quill work there with that pipe bag. And, you know, you can see how, how that has, um, how that has changed too. And you still have many people who do the quill work on moccasins and who do the, what you call, what you see here. Um, this is often referred to as lazy stitch, you know, the lazy stitch beadwork. And some people, it varies from using anywhere from eight beads to 12 beads. And it depends on, you know, um, what, you know, that person might feel in making, you know, their regalia or making articles, so to speak. And, you know, designs are also reflective of um, morning star designs. Um, you have the mountains, you have uh, the, um, dragonfly, you know, and you have the turtle, you know, there's different things that, you know, people use within their designs, an excellent source for our people of uh, an anthropologist, Alfred Krober, who came in among our people. Um, he documented many of the traditional designs of our Northern Arapaho people. And that's an excellent book to get, you know, and it's, um, Alfred Krober, and I can't remember right offhand what the name of the book is. I, I loaned that book to my daughter-in-law and I also loaned that book to um, one of our, my co-teachers who was actually doing a class on, in her math class uh, with Native American designs and so forth. And in that book, you can look and see, you know, you can see the designs that were reflective of uh, the mountains, of a dragonfly, of a turtle, and you know, of even the bear, and you know, it's an excellent, uh, excellent book to go to. And I think maybe, uh, Ali, I don't know if you've ever seen that book by Krober. On I have, I have. Yeah. We've actually been looking for copies. I, I can't find them. They're any hard to get. They yeah. are. They're hard to Very find. Very hard. Yeah. And I do have my own copy that I loaned out. Hopefully, I get it back. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, one of the things, too, in teaching Native American literature is that many of the books are out of print. And um, the, the one press that I've been going to, the uh, Nebraska, I think University of Nebraska, they do have quite a few of like The Four Heels of Life by Jeffrey Anderson. Um, he had that book's on, um, that one's hard to find now, too. So, and, you know, um, so that's, you know, part of, with me, um, and again, you know, I was, a, I was like, you know, when we were introduced as being experts, and Ali and I both that talked about that, we said, no, we're not experts, you know, we're, <laughs> we just want to share from the heart of, of how we feel about our, our way of life, of how we feel about what we do with our regalia, what we do, what we, uh, and what we create for our families, what we create for our children, our grandchildren. And it's just much more than just putting a pretty design down with beadwork. That beadwork can tell a story. That beadwork can be reflective of a time within a person's life of, of um, maybe how much they, um, things that they've accomplished for themselves and so forth, you know, and it can be reflective of their home. They might incorporate the design of the mountains. They might incorporate the design of the dragonfly. Um, I know my granddaughter, um, her beadwork, her mother, and that's the one I was going to bring today. Um, her, her Indian name is Morning Star Singer. And her mother used our Northern Arapaho design of the Morning Star. And she used that with her beadwork. And I, you know, this morning I was rushing and then it wasn't until like 15 minutes before this meeting started because my classes start right at 830. And I go and go and I was like, oh my goodness, I forgot, you know, I, I inadvertently left that at home. But, you know, Ali, I seen what you were starting. And 
one of the things too is when we do our beadwork, you know, we do do this too, also to honor our families. Um, our high school, we graduate in traditional regalia uh, beadwork. Um, we have young, our, our young ladies, you know, sometimes the mothers and grandmothers begin doing their buckskin dresses when they're freshmen. So that, that way, when they graduate as seniors, they have a fully beat up buckskin. Uh, sometimes others do dentalium capes. Um, sometimes families dress their grandchildren or their sons and daughters with, you know, ribbon shirts. And um, this year we had quite a few wear the ribbon skirts with uh, moccasins. And, you know, it's just, you know, we, we, we use this as a means to, to honor our families, ourselves, our, our way of life. And, you know, it's much more than a textile, you know, it's part of us, it's part of who we are. And, you know, um, and there comes that cultural appropriation too of, you know, especially this past week with Halloween, you know, you don't dress up as an Indian, you don't dress up as a any other ethnic group, because that's part of who they are. That's part of what defines them. And, you know, I, I just wanted to share that from the heart and, you know, from my, my perspective, not only as a mother, but as a grandmother, as a teacher. And, you know, I, I have a long ways to go yet too, and learning more about um, what things, you know, our oral traditions. And, you know, it's a learning process all the time. You know, you never quit learning. And, you know, I want to acknowledge, you know, that we have many, many um, artisans here on the Wind River Indian Reservation who I would consider experts. And I, um, you know, I said their names earlier because they do awesome work. Um, they're very, very talented people who, who are well known throughout the region, not only here on the Wind River, but who are well known throughout Indian country, so to speak, you know, with with the uh, work that they do. And the, the blue reminds me of um, Elena and Jenny and Gloria. <laughs> you know, um, Ali, you see that blue there? Mm -hmm. um, they use a lot of blue with their beadwork. And I seen that and I was like, that really reminded me um, the one on this left side of um, those three ladies, those three beautiful ladies who are well known for their beadwork. And so um, I'm kind of monopolizing the time here so Ali I'll I'll turn it over to you <laughs> okay all right I also want to thank you guys for asking me to be a part of this um um my Arapaho name is peppermint woman and I am a northern Arapaho woman um and I think um when it comes to these moccasins I think it, what's really cool is that I think as Native people, just by looking at these moccasins, we can just, I mean, and, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, but just by looking at those moccasins, we're able to, the ones on the left determine that those are more Cheyenne style and Lakota style and Arapaho style, as compared to the other side, we can recognize um, that those are crow styles, sh show band style. Um, and it's indicative based on how those beads lay, based on the colors, based on even the outline of that moccasin. So I think that's really cool. Um, and just kind of referring back to what Sandy said, how um, when she was mentioning Gloria and uh, Jenny and Elena, Another thing that I think is really cool is that um, not only are styles unique to tribes, but even within family members and even within um, within the tribe specifically, um, you know, like you're able to, um, there's certain things that some, some moccasin makers do to distinguish themselves from others. There's, they'll leave like a, a signature, um, you know, under the, under the tongue or, or um, I know one guy who kind of leaves out um, the thing called the welt, he kind of leaves a little bit of a towel out so that you're able to recognize that that's his work. Um, and so I think it's really important to also identify that we, it varies amongst each other. Um, 
in and individually and and also for the purpose of what these moccasins might be used for what they're intended for Thanks, Ali. That kind of segues into, I know I'm really excited because you are working on some pairs of moccasins right now. And if you're willing, we would love to see them and hear about them. Sure. So these ones that you guys see right now were actually my first completed pair. <laughs> um, and they were made for my baby. She, my sister, well, she's not really, my, she's my aunt. Um, she had gifted my oldest daughter with um, some regalia to wear at a powwow, but she didn't, um, there weren't any moccasins with it. And so I told my mom I needed, my mom makes moccasins. And so I told her I needed some and she was like, I'm not just gonna give, I'm not just gonna make them, you have to learn. Um, and so that was my first, that was the first time I ever made them. Um, and that was the first completed pair, so. They're so precious. You can tell they're tiny. Yeah, can you they talk are. A little bit about the like color choices and how you decided to design them. So, um, I picked the colors based off of the outfit that she. I wanted them to match um, her outfit that she had, and then um, because I was still learning, I just kind of picked a pretty basic geometric design for these ones. Um, something that was going to be quick for me um, because like I said it was the very first pair I ever made and I just wanted to kind of get it done <laughs> so there weren't really any any All special right, meaning ask, how long is quick for a little pair of moccasins oh, man. you know what so my mom actually had to finish the left side because that first so the story behind those were there was a powwow, it was like a Monday and then Ithachi celebration was happening that weekend. <laughs> so she taught me that Monday evening and by like Wednesday, I was still working on them. So she took over on the other side and it, it she's, she, it, because they were so small, it took her that day, but it took me days to finish that right side. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then those ones are also, um, those ones I didn't finish. They still need to have soles put on to them. And this design right here, um, it's actually one of my favorite designs. And I don't really know why. It's, it's supposed to be a hoof. Um, and you can kind of see where the purple is, where that's shaded out. Um, you know, that's supposed to signify the hoof. And and those colors I chose um, just because, again, she was, a lot of people love my girls, thankfully. <laughs> and they were gifted some regalia again, and I wanted those to match their regalia. Um, and so that geometric design on the sides, again, was just pretty basic. But the middle, um, the top part of the moccasin, I wanted it to be a, a hoof. So I absolutely love the color of these ones. Katie, did yeah. you want to jump in too? I just wanted to make sure that Allie saw that there were lots of comments in the chat box of saying, wow, beautiful work. And um, I'll just echo those <laughs> comments as well. These are beautiful and I can't wait to see them finished. I know. Hopefully. I love seeing the process though too. I'm so grateful that you shared these photos of them incomplete just to be able to kind of see the layout. Right. Can right. you talk a little bit about that, Allie, and the process? And Sandy, if you want to chime in with process of how how you make a moccasin, that would be awesome. Um, so for me, and and again, it might vary from family to family. What we do, and it, it's funny because um just referencing an email that Katie had sent out to me yesterday, she had asked me what size they were, and I couldn't give her an answer because <laughs> We don't use like shoe sizes or anything. We use their actual footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and so they stand on that piece of paper and then you just outline their, um, their foot. And then you also, what I use is I use a, a, um, a ruler to kind of go around and increase that length because you don't want it to be just the exact size of their, their footprint because then it's not gonna fit, their foot's not gonna fit in that moccasin. 
and then there's it's it's hard to explain it um and not be able to show you guys but then you just take that same footprint and you lay it down on another piece of paper and there's certain things that you do to that um paper to manipulate the sides and that's how you get the um the width of the top of the moccasin so i mean i don't i don't know anything and then you take that those tracings and like the top chase you save that footprint for the leather or for whatever you're going to use as the sole but then you take that top part and you put it on the hide um i use the permanent marker if you can tell <laughs> <laughs> but you use like a pencil or a pen and then you just cut it out and then that's when you're able to start beading. And what Ali shared, you know, in that you need to make sure um, my daughter-in-law and myself as well, when I did my, my um, children's moxins, I made sure that I left enough, you know, to um, include the welt too as well and being able to turn it. Um, that's the hard part is turning it, you know, when you depending on what type of soul. Um, one time I watched Gloria do a pair of moxins and uh, she soaked the soul. I mean, she got it wet and then she beat it on the, the, um, the leather, I mean, the, the buckskin. And she, that's what helped her when it was still damp to turn it because, you know, the, the thicker the soul and you know, some use Latigo, um, some use, um, I know there's some craft shops that sell like, a, it's almost like a rubber texture alley. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Some of those places, it's black and it's, you know, kind of rough on one side and kind of looks like leather on another side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's different ways that, uh, you know, that you can, um, some use elk hide, you know, but I've noticed that quite a few, you, quite a few use the Latigo. And you can see like where with um, the different, um, like even Allie, how her, her moxins are with her little ones, you know, you can see the different shape and stuff. It all depends on, you know, um, what you trace with the feet too as well. And like I said, you know, I'm not an expert either, but I'm just going to buy what, you know, I've done for my family and so forth. And you have to make sure you cut them out right too, because, you know, we were talking about that, Allison, you know, last week about how, you know, make sure you cut them out right so they don't look like uh, big fry bread. So they go out. Yeah, like really. <laughs> you know, to where, you you know, you have a big old, you know, round up here and it goes narrow mm -hmm. and you just need to make sure you cut them right. But wow, Ellie, I'm proud of you. Holy smokes, that's some good work there. And I really love that color purple too, because you know purple is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if you had. So if you see, and then another thing is, um, kind of back back to what Sandy was saying, things kind of change for us, for Native people, based on what's available to us and what kind of is like in style and what where we are in life and so if you notice um, in this picture specifically you can see that the hide is white and it's because it's a commercial hide it's it's not real and so it's it's so much harder to beat on this type of hide as opposed to the the previous picture um, where that one is is actual you know actual hide tanned hide and and it doesn't, the difference between the two is that wider hide is it's stretchy, it's, 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 it's difficult. <laughs> I probably won't ever use that kind again. <laughs> <laughs> and even wow. with, um, I'm sorry, but even with uh, change in times too, one of the themes that I see, you know, with um, a lot of the contemporary beadwork is sometimes they bead on um, other other material. Um, yeah. I need some bead on actual, um, you know, the crib sheets that you mm -hmm. know you use for babies. I've seen people bead on that and on canvas too, as well. Right. You know, I see that with the beaded tops that you see with the um, buckskin dresses and so forth, you know. And um, it's, you know, and it comes with a changing of time, 
you know, mm -hmm. you, um, but most of the, well, all of the moccasins my, my family has made, my daughter-in-law, they're all made with um, buckskin and, you know, none of them are beaded on um, other material. The only thing is the leggings are on the canvas, you know, the leggings that we do have. Yeah. Allie, you want to share a little bit of why you're making these? The ones right here? <laughs> well, this one is, um, so like Sandy said, I don't like to refer to myself as a professional. And so the only ones I've ever made are baby moccasins. And so I, I, I'm about to graduate. I'm in my final year of undergrad and I'm on track to graduate in May. And I thought, I started thinking ahead about what I wanted for myself for my graduation. And um, my mom offered to have some moccasins made for me, but I figured I would try to make them on my own. Um, and so that's what the purpose of these moccasins are for. Um, but, and then going back to what Sandy said, we as native people, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of meaning behind what we do and we have to be careful on how we move forward and how we do things. And so I started these in July, um, and I'm not very far, but it's because, um, I don't, I don't like to bead when I'm, when I'm stressed or when I'm worried. And this um, virus has had a big impact on my mental health. And then also as a student, I'm so stressed and I'm so busy and I, I just don't feel like it would be appropriate for me to work under those circumstances. So I'm hoping to finish them up over Christmas break. And I'm proud of you for, um, for that as well. And for those of you who are not aware, Allie is my niece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's the daughter of my first cousin, my brother cousin, um, Alonzo Moss Jr. And so, you know, I'm very, very proud of her, of what she has accomplished for herself. And, you know, Allie was also one of my students yes. <laughs> here at yeah. Wyoming Indian. I've been teaching for over, um, well, 35 years. And you know, um, I love what I do. And like I, you know, shared, you know, I'm, I'm first and foremost, you know, a mother and a grandmother, and I'm a teacher as well. But, you know, everything that I do, I do for my kids, I do for my children, I do for my people, I do for my students. And, you know, and I'm just really proud of you, Ali, and sharing that part. And especially, you know, for Deborah, you know, for asking us to, and, and you know, Katie, and, you know, Michelle, we're asking us to be part of this because you know we um, we come from um, a strong family, both Ali and I, and we're kind of um, modest about you know putting ourselves out there and so forth. You know, we don't want you know you know like we said, we're not experts. You know, and I heard that you know we brought experts. So like, no, we and uh, <laughs> you know, just yeah. like, um, we're just here to share and speak from the heart of what we see, what we what we feel about, you know, with what we do in creating beautiful pieces for our children to dance with, to be able to walk with, and to be able to participate in various scenes, you know, among our people. And it's just, you know, that's part of those oral traditions too, that, you know, what we do is part of those oral traditions that are handed down from generation to generation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, we're, we're given a part of ourselves, you know, and, and again, I'm honored to be here and proud to be Ali. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. We're so honored to have you both here and especially Ali sharing the personal projects that you're working on. Um, before we get to an open Q&A for everyone, I just wanted to make sure that I could call forth my colleague, Deborah who has been leading the way with all of our programming for Native American Heritage Month. And uh, if you're there, Deborah, would you mind telling us a little bit more about how people can participate in what we're doing? Yeah, sure. So before I worked for the art museum, I used to work in the student financial aid office and I was connected to a lot of the uh, student programming. And so we partnered with the Native American Center here on campus to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. 
we just happen to have the moccasins on display. So I thought, what a great idea, what a great opportunity to get the art museum involved in celebrating the Native American Heritage Month. So um, the center is hosting a week of speakers, virtual speakers next week. They have a flyer available on their website. We are doing, um, this is our first event, the lunchtime conversations with the curators. And then we're having an event on Saturday, which is Family Saturday, where they'll be making some arts and crafts with Sandy and Allie and our master teacher, Jen. And we are also hosting a Rock Your Mocks photo contest that will start on Monday and run through Thursday. And the winners will be announced on our social media pages on Friday. And we have some prizes for that too. So we, um, when we were visiting with um, Sandy and talking about the programming, um, Michelle had asked about, what can non-Native people do to support um, during this month and during this time if they don't, if even if non-Native uh, American people or non-Native people don't have moccasins, they can wear ribbon dresses or turquoise or beadwork. Um, uh, Michelle and I, we talk a lot about our sewing projects and we, um, my husband and I actually um, made the two dresses that Michelle and Katie are wearing in the, in the picture here. We made them over the summer because for a ceremony for, um, I was gonna go up to Bearview and fast, but that ended up getting postponed because of the virus. And so Michelle was gonna try to make her own ribbon dress. And we've been so busy with programming for the month that we were just running out of hours in the day. And so I was like, what about the dress I made? And so we um, exchanged that. And Kate, I was like, there's an extra one if Katie wants to wear a ribbon dress. And so, and I also brought in some gifts for them and my coworkers because they have just embraced um, Native American Heritage Month at a moment's notice and have, you know, it was Katie's idea to do the lunchtime conversations and also include Family Saturday. I just wanted to like celebrate Rock Your Mocks because of the moccasins and do some stickers. And it actually turned into this huge event for November and collaboration with the Native American Heritage, or the Native American Center and the Native American and Indigenous Studies program as well on campus. So it's been amazing. It's been a lot of fun. And I was able to bring in things and share with my colleagues in our staff meeting this morning. We looked at um, shawls from the hand games from my tribe that we've used and then um, and a dress that I found in my in my items when I was looking for the belt for today and some of our moccasins that have been passed down. Um, the fully beaded small moccasins are my brothers and the, the pink and blue ones are my twins moccasins when they were born. The medallion was a gift for me and my graduation at Chief Donnelly College. And so, and the beaded belts, those are all items that have been in our family and passed down that I was able to bring in and share with the staff here. And like, as Ali and Sandy were saying, you know, this is just like our way of life and just a part of our everyday life and things that we do often, but to see it through a different lens and like see other people really appreciate it and really are fascinated with it and have a lot of questions. It's just really cool to share. So thank you all for letting me share our culture with you. And thank you, Katie and Michelle and Rachel and Chandra and everybody that's been just, you know, working extra hours to make this all a success. And thank you, Ali and Sandy for joining us. We really appreciate your expertise. <laughs> thank you all so much. There are a couple of questions that have been kind of 
popped and peppered into the chat box. Um, and in case folks haven't seen any of them, I just wanted to chime in. Um, Sarita was wondering, this was a question for Allie that Allie did answer, but will this be something that you work on with your family side by side over the holidays? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that, Allie, and what your, your hope for that might be? So my hope is that my mom will help me, but <laughs> she might not. She might make me do it all on my own. Um, but I'm hoping so because, I, like I said, I'm trying to get them done in time um, to, gradu to graduate. And so I want to get them done before um, the spring semester starts because then that's just going to fly by. So, so yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions that folks might have? I always have questions, but I, I want to give others the opportunity to ask. And if you want, feel free to unmute yourselves. We're a nice small group today. And so it can be an intimate conversation, which is one of the goals of lunchtime conversations. So, and Michelle, chime in with questions that you might have. I saw you writing notes throughout, so. <laughs> I will also let other people get a chance first, but I've got tons of questions. <laughs> Maybe while we're waiting for somebody to enter in the chat box, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot with this exhibition is kind of the gendered aspect of a lot of this kind of work. And so I wondered, do you know many men who do beadwork or is it typically something that women do? And then also in thinking about the designs themselves of the moccasins, like what kind of gender differences might there be in colors or symbols? So I can answer really quickly just for the Crow tribe, just right off the top of my head, the first person that comes to my mind is um, Arliss Whiteman. And he's very well known for his beadwork for beading earrings and um, other dance regalia. So he's in high demand and does really beautiful work. And so, uh, and then as I was growing up, I recall that there was always um, one of my grandpas, he's gone now, but um, his name was Joe Curley. And he used to be um, like, uh, they're called um, gourds that you um, shake and sing and there's a peyote stitch that goes around them. And it's, so it's like a musical, um, musical instrument. And he was really well known for doing very good what they call peyote stitch, where it beads around the handle of the gourd. So those are people that were men that were really well known for their work. Among um, our people um, would be Marcus Dewey, um, uh, also um, their brother, James Dewey and uh, Charles Dewey, who are well known you know, for their work that they do. Um, they've done quite a bit of work for us. Uh, James Dewey did the fully beat up vest for us, you know, for Pat's dance regalia. And uh, um, also Charles Dewey has done quite a bit of work for me with different themes that I've had to, you know, might be um, getting ready for a ceremony and so forth. You know, he's helped do some items for me as well. And actually, you know, um, here um, on my coworkers, Taylor, her many horses is also um, well known for his speed work as his uncle, I believe is email. Her many horses is also well known. And so, you know, um, men are, you know, the, the it, it's not a gender thing. Um, both men and women can bead. Both men and women can, you know, um, the only one, the only thing I know, um, a long time ago was with our quill work. You know, when someone worked with quill work, they had to be given that way. And, you know, um, but now again, it's different, you know, to be able to, you know, how they lay them flat and put their designs and so forth. And a person had to have that way. When I was in high school, um, the last person I knew, knew who had that way was um, Marguerite, Marguerite Spoonhunter. And, and, you know, she was the last one I knew who actually had that way given to her. And so, you know, but for me, um, but for what I know, it, it, it's, you know, it's not restrictive to either male or female. Allie, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah, I don't, I've never heard of that either. I mean, I just, I've never been told that men can, couldn't do it either. And there's actually, like Sandy said, a lot of, a lot of men and who do really good work. Um, and it's not, and I think that also kind of just ties into how we look at each other um, from a native perspective. So, yeah. Thank you. Katie, do you have any questions or should I keep going? <laughs> I was gonna say, we probably have time for one more. Go ahead, Michelle. Let's see. Um, okay, I was kind of wondering too, and you may have touched on it a little bit, but what does it mean or what do you think about seeing this beadwork in an art museum setting? Well, for me, you know, um, as long as it's done in a tasteful way up to where it's recognizing the contributions of that artisan, you know, making sure that you give acknowledge, acknowledge that person because it also, you know, shows respect for, for that piece of, um, whether it's moxins, whether it's a vest, whether it's uh, even gourds and even um, some, I see like up in Cody, you know, you see the blankets, you know, the horse, uh, the, the blankets and you see the, you, even the winter counts, you know, from the different, uh, from different tribes and so forth. Um, it, you know, for me, it, it can go either way because, you know, it, it, for me, if it's tastefully done to where it's respecting that person and respecting that tribe, then I, I am comfortable with that. But, you know, when, if it's not, you know, if it was, and there's no way of telling when something was taken from a family, when something was just taken for as a trophy. And so, you know, a lot of what I see, I like to see when they say, you know, that it was donated by a family member um, or that it came from a collection from another person because, you know, you're, you're, you're sharing a part of your family history. And sometimes I see beadwork that's donated on loan from different families, you know, that you see on displays in different um, museums throughout Cody, you know, I've seen that at Cody where they displayed um, buckskin dresses from different families and that they were loaned there, you know, just loaned and given to, uh, to, to for display and showing the artwork of uh, the dress styles of the different tribes in this area. But, you know, that's my perspective there. And, it, and it's just how you approach anything and what you do in life and even with your other textiles from other ethnic groups, you know, that it's done tastefully, that it's done with respect, that it's done with acknowledging that person's contribution or that family's contribution to, to show a beautiful part of, of their lives. You know, and that's just me. That's just my perspective. Thank you for sharing. Do you have any other thoughts, Ali? Um, I, I agree with Sandy, and I think it's also important um, that point of view, that perspective is important because we also want to be careful of what we're displaying because we don't know what the purpose of those items were for and and what they meant to to those people. Um, and because these things they hold they hold power to us and we don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want anybody else to be hurt. And so, yeah. Michelle, I just want to jump in and add on to that when, so I'm new to the field of art and museums. And when I lived in Denver in 2008, during that time, 2008 to 2011, we visited the Denver Museum of uh, Nature and Science. And we, uh, it's a huge museum, like many, many floors, many, many exhibits. and we went downstairs and, and we were tired and we were getting done. It was, I was ready to go and we went downstairs and downstairs they had several exhibitions that were Plains Indians and the Crows. I was like, where did they get my camp? <laughs> because it looked like Crow Fair and it looked exactly like our camp at Crow Fair and the the people had on our, our, our altitude dresses and 
the planes looked just like behind our camp and it was just it I it was amazing and I was sharing that with our director and chief curator and so we've both seen it through two different lenses like to me it was really personal it was amazing it was like I was in Denver and then I stepped into my camp at Crow Fair which was like it was like a good connection for me being away from home and so it so I was really, I really appreciated it because it was done really well, but I wanted to know more about it. Like, who were they? Where did they get all this stuff? How did they know? And so um, when I shared it with our director and chief curator, she was like, wow, they did a really good job on that. And so it was really amazing to see the two pieces come together. And that's what I was like, so appreciative of with material tradition because when we were looking at the basic um, descriptions of the objects I was asking politely because I didn't know and I asked Michelle can we call them what we call them or do we have to say they're like shoes or something like that and she was like no we can call them what they're supposed to be called and so and it was really exciting for Dara, our collections manager, because she was like, thank you, because you gave them life. And that was cool too. So I think it's it's really amazing when we are able, when we come to a museum who really appreciates that and embraces that and emulates that in their exhibitions. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. Before I let Katie take over, I just want to thank you again for the collaboration. I think that you really, really helped to inform this exhibition, and I hope that we're doing the pieces justice. And I think that we'll continue to learn more about them and add that to our record so that in the future we can continue to do better. Well, that was a perfect segue to a closing closing piece and I just want to echo everyone thank you so much to our special guests Sandy and Allie thank you Deborah for the connections thank you Michelle for curating thank you Rachel for letting us see the exhibition today um, and it's such a good reminder that we're all still constantly learning and this has been good medicine for my soul to learn more about a culture that's been my neighbor for a long time. So I just thank you so much um, from the bottom of my heart and this will this is recorded so it'll be posted later today so feel free to share. We'd love more people to hear the conversation today. So um, take good care of all of yourselves and happy Native American Heritage Month. Thank you all, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you, Allie. Bye. Love you. Be close, Love you. Love you. See you later. Bye. <laughs>